Welcome everyone, today we have a bit of a short story from the realms of hell. This is what happens when a publisher needs something and it is actively quite darn bad for you. So I want you to imagine this. Do you remember when the recent Battlefield game came out and it actually transpired that other Battlefield games like perhaps Battlefield 4 or Battlefield 5 were doing better than Battlefield 2042? And that looked kind of bad. Well, imagine if EA said, hmm, all these people playing the old game is actually hurting our business, so we're going to pull those old games and you can only play Battlefield 2042, or at least we'll try to confuse you into only thinking that's the thing that you can play. That is literally what has happened today, and I think it's one that actually will touch uh, a lot of, uh, well, a lot of us from when we first got phones and ended up playing Angry Birds because yes, today it is Rovio doing that. And even though I don't think any of us really care about Angry Birds, it's more the behavior that's going on. And it does point out something that could happen and is a real risk. Everything that you like has to go away eventually because what you like isn't profitable enough. This is the future. Welcome to it. I hope you enjoy your stay. I certainly am. It's fantastic. Yeah, um, for what it's worth, I don't see any reason why our game, The Pill Beyond, will uh, fall into any of these traps. It will be on Steam for as long as there is Steam, and you can play it. And for those who aren't familiar with how long Steam is going to be around, I believe Gabe may once have said that there is a kill switch that will kill Steam DRM if it ever isn't suitable for purpose so people can play their games. As long as electricity and computers exist, The Pill Beyond will be playable. So if you want to have a laugh, right? We have reviewed the business case for Rovio Classics Angry Bird. And due to the game's impact on our wider games portfolio, we have decided that Rovio Classics Angry Bird will be unlisted from Google Play Thursday, February 24th. It will be renamed to Red's First Flight in the App Store pending further review. Rovio Classics Angry Bird will remain playable on devices on which the game has been downloaded even after it's been unlisted. We understand this may be sad news for many fans, uh, as well as the team that has worked hard to make Rovio Classics Angry Bird a reality. We're extremely grateful to the Angry Birds fans, blah, 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 blah. And they basically announce, right? Uh, yanking it from Google Play, renaming it to Red's First Flight so that whenever people type in Angry Birds, it doesn't appear. And uh, they're essentially doing this so that you can go and uh, enjoy the games, of course. Um, well, <laughs> we hope that fans can continue to bring that passion to our live Angry Birds slingshot games, such as Angry Birds 2, Angry Birds Friends, and Angry Birds Journey. Yeah, so basically the good version that was not completely corrupted by bullshit is being either pulled or hidden so that people will naturally fall into the evil hellscape version of the game. I absolutely love it. I'm so surprised that they even bothered to make a review of classics Angry Birds. But you could imagine how frustrating it must be for the developers, because I'm sure everyone was happy to do that. I'm sure all the players are like, oh yeah, because that really highlights exactly what's wrong with this entire... I Okay, the mobile industry and the video games that we play as an industry are definitely different, but there's a lot of overlap. And the fact that this might ever be pulled on any of our games is utterly sickening. And it also kind of maybe depends on your uh, version of what life services are, but kind of maybe... If you liked Babylon's Fall, maybe this kind of applies. Or if you <laughs> liked Final Fantasy VII, The First Soldier, it's the kind of thing where, yeah, if your game isn't making money, the game that you like isn't making them money, it has no right to exist because, especially in this case, it's the good one. It's the better one. It's the one people like, the one that spawned the legacy. But no, sorry. And if you ever wonder why, as an example, Sony have an incentive to not really release old PS1 classics that are very good like very very good if, they, if you ever want to just have a little bit of a conspiracy now you've got the ammo well it's very I mean, interesting that's not likely with, not true, but uh, with nintendo and pokemon there's yeah. so many people that just say like and, and you know some of these pokemon games the only way to play them is emulated because the carts have you know the carts aren't in production you cannot buy loads of pokemon games that are relatively new uh, you cannot buy them new right um, and of course, with some of the carts where there's like a, an actual power issue as time goes on, that's kind of annoying. A lot of people just say, well, like Nintendo, just add all the Pokemon games to like Switch Online or something that you would make all the money. And if it seems so obvious, then why aren't they doing it? I suppose that's the question. Now for this, their community manager, Sean, said that, uh, yeah, Angry Birds, the classic version, is negatively impacting their other games, and that's what, as a company, they have to focus on. If these other games do not improve and grow, then the outlook of the entire company changes. It's hard to create new games, work on new projects. I'm sure that's not something you would want. So basically, the thing here is, because Angry Birds Classic is not free. 
It's 99 cents with no microtransactions. You just buy it and you have it. And evidently, because you got to remember, especially in the mobile realm, like, man, the telemetry, the, you know, the analytics that they all have is just absolutely incredible. Um, I mean, even take Zynga. One of the things that propelled Zynga to being a pretty damn large company was a massive investment by Mark Pincus, was it? Into data science. They just got loads of data scientists, right? So they know their numbers. And they're obviously seeing that this is doing inordinately well and people are not playing their other games. I think a lot of people have ended up just thinking like, well, I could just have the whole thing for 99 cents and that will get my Angry Birds fix. I think that's ultimately the problem you run into here when you have a game that, you know, it was not established as a Candy Crush saga that just lasts forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's rough. Basically, you need to be recurring revenue. Now, as for how we know about this, well, this actually isn't the first time that Rovio's done this sort of uh, thing, right? So a decade after Angry Birds came out, they actually delisted it from app stores for testing purposes. And then in 2021, they actually brought it back with a very conciliatory uh, statement. The old Angry Birds games are some of the most loved, downloaded, and known games in the world. We know we're proud to have made them overwhelmingly happy, blah, blah, blah. We took them out of circulation. We didn't say anything that let you down. Not cool. We promise our heart was in the right place. We wanted to focus on building new and even better games to serve our players. It was was about money. Uh, The thing is, maintaining the highest quality of updates and live operations isn't possible with our older games. Basically, the idea of like, hey, these games are so ancient, you know, we, we cannot do this kind of thing. Today's mobile technology and games landscape has evolved to a place where supporting them was untenable, and we can't just leave them there and not update them, as games need to comply with all sorts of platform requirements. Ten, you know, ten game years is like a hundred game years, and that is, like, kind of fair, but ultimately, like, we can kind of see their decently fair rationale, but the thing that makes it clear is what they have done now post it being on the store for 99 cents. And that's just not really something that, uh, yeah, that we like to see happen. It does bring a pretty interesting question to the fore, which is when are we finished with video games? And I think the problem is that if you're making video games correctly, obviously that's got an asterisk to it. Then you're never done because you always make something better, but it's so transparently against player freedom. It was like, Hey, we have made, and actually, you know what? You know what's a good example? Capcom are a good example of this. They thrive on back catalog sales. They've been praising their back catalog sales like crazy. And they've been the ones who are just making consistently good games. And when they're done making a game, they go, we'll go make another one. We'll make the next game that will sell just as well. And you know what that means? That means when players go, which video game will I play? Maybe I'll see what Capcom have to offer. Then they see two really good games that they can play. And then, you know, oh, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five maybe 15 and then you can fill, you can gorge in capcom games as much as you want because you know they're good and that feels like the way it should be that feels like the way it should work but the dark arts of recurring revenue for a live service has clearly thrown that into complete disarray where it's oh, you know what really annoys me it's so exploitative and so distrustful that's the point because if you if you made a better game people will be playing it but the point is that like with the you know with the requirements that they have for these new games being live games right it's the the idea that to take like an example from other some fish puzzler or you know candy crush or whatever the levels get harder and harder and harder to the point where oh in order to maintain your streak you feel like you've got to purchase you know power-ups right and i mean some of these games are so manipulative i for i've forgotten its name it's a match three game that's all about like fish and aquariums and the way that it has like the streaks and the way that it abuses every single psychological trick in the book. Like if they had fish bejeweled game, classic, and people just play the game and it was fun. Well, then, you know, it would it would obviously make them so much less money. And what's weird about a lot of these games is like the, the grind is the game. That's what Stockholm Syndrome somebody into that game now being their default thing that their thumb does when they flick their phone open before they even know where they're going on their phone. That's uh, that's how it gets with stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's it's rough, but you then look at the wider context where, uh, you know, all that stuff they said like two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, doesn't really matter because they just make it very clear that right now it is just about the money. Now they've also talked about, uh, they said this at the start of February, a uh, sort of strategic review of the whole company that seemingly is all part of a move towards selling the company overall, making efficiencies and making it look promising to potential buyers. From the player's perspective though, you're basically just screwed. And if you want some Angry Birds, just get Angry 
Birds trilogy secondhand for the Nintendo 3DS, because then <laughs> it'll actually be yours on a game cart, and they can't fiddle around with it like this. Another good example of this, actually, there was a game, um, it was, imagine like a, a dune sandworm, but it's like 2D, and the sandworm would go around underneath the oh, ground, yes. and then you'd sort of control it to go up, where it would like eat a bunch of army dudes, and you know, chomp their helicopter, and then go back into the ground. Now, that used to work as a sort of, uh, almost like a snake thing. You, you know, the, the more things you eat, the larger and like more powerful you get, and it would be about how long you can survive. The new version of that is a live service version, where it's now been split into levels. And where, you know, those levels just get harder and harder and harder, etc. But the endless mode, like the, the way that the game was actually meant to be, its original design isn't there. You just have to hit a certain goal in a level, which basically means that it's completely undercut the core player fantasy of that game. And that's a great example of if it has to be a big mobile game like what we're seeing here, it just kills the core experience. How often is this happening behind closed doors in other video game publishers absolutely in other video game developers how much of this is because this is a game that everyone loved and is very good and was fairly cheap and it's been killed obviously post-launch long time post-launch but how many games are never being born because of this and there's a kind of stuff that i'm obviously i'm happy with video games because a lot of lots of good ones are coming out regardless so you can't really look at the industry and go oh this sucks unless you're maybe a PC only player at the minute and then your your selection of your games is a little bit limited unless you like indies but it is it's stuff like this we go ah there's so much left on the table there's so much potential left on the table because of decisions like this because the games industry is not being served by the businesses the businesses are being served by the games as far as i'm concerned that's a little bit backwards and this is one of the most frustrating examples of it i've ever seen hang on there's actually an example of, not literally this, but it is an example of this in a less direct way. Oh. So, obviously you go, well, games delisted for some reason, and to bring it back would require a bit of energy, but the company is currently spending the energy elsewhere because it's all about, you know, what's an employee doing? Is that activity making enough money? Oh, well, we can't have them go back and do a thing that's not going to make enough money. Mm. And that is the Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 delistings by Konami. Oh, yeah. Last year, that were temporary delistings. I think it was 18 months ago now. Temporary delistings because of licensing issues or something along those lines. Or maybe, I can't remember, I think it was something along those lines. And they just said, I oh, will get them back on. And they never did because they're too busy going. It's not important to them, really. Yeah. The legacy of video games, some of the best video games ever made, not important enough to Konami. And that's why this isn't just a mobile game issue. This is a the business of gaming issue. Yeah, like we bring it up because mobile, like it is the canary in the coal mine. Who the hell really knows? Uh, I mean, it's been dead for a long time. It keeps on respawning and dying again. So we should all feel pretty bad for that canary. Yeah. Uh, but point being like really horrible stuff happens in mobile first because that's where they can get away with it. So in the same the way. <laughs> yeah, where they get the ideas in the same way that the bad stuff happens in sports games that aren't really going out to as much of a core gamer audience. So they'll just accept things that, that we won't. And, uh, you know, the, the slow encroachment of this bullshit will uh, keep on happening for as long as it is not pushed back against, for as long as, uh, you know, it is not fought against, uh, trying even the gachification of things that was done in Battlefront 2, which, of course, we were able to fight back. Um, but, yeah, we've got to watch out, especially perhaps as the, uh, you know, the Mihoyoverse games do better and better and better and better. And maybe the Western publishers look at that and think, hmm, how about instead of blasters and grenades... We made the gacha be about digital women. Fantastic. And digital hot boys. And pull to Genshin. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they want to do that. They are, they, it's just a matter of when will they be allowed to. Yeah. But there is hope. Because I literally just saw a factoid that was out today. There's a certain game released just over a year ago and it kind of took the world a little bit by storm. And that game, Elden Ring, has now sold 20 million copies. That's a lot of copies. That's more copies than most video games. So there is at least some hope that success can be found. Because if Elden Ring is, if, oh, what was the point there? Innovation. Good game. People wanted it. Innovation. The fact that it was the outlier made everyone go and buy it. So hopefully people, hopefully enough studios are looking at that and going, we don't have to use the dark arts. We just have to get good at making video games. Well, that'll be a challenge, but should we maybe give it a go? At least... We can all hope so. Absolutely. So that's it for us today. Of course, our game has uh, just came out. So check out The Pill Beyond on Steam. Uh, and uh, yeah, have fun. And with that, I'll see you next time.